love that you gave me and the constant encouragement. With that said, I want to jump right in to talk about my message today, which has nothing to do with Father's Day. I call it Wisdom's Self-Portrait. Wisdom's Self-Portrait. And I want to read from Proverbs 8. Oh, sorry, I did forget one thing. Morgan made me promise to make a sign and I forgot. We have a lot of people missing today for very practical reasons. What that means to you, practically speaking, is there's no coffee today. And she made me promise to make a sign, which I did not do. So I'm here by telling you, coffee will be back next week. Now that I've done that, I want to read Proverbs 8, 30 and 31 says this. Then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world his earth, and having my delight in sons of men. I'll read that again. Then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight. Rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. Let's pray. Father, I'm just grateful for your word. And we are a people who, de- who are Bible believers, and we desire to be more convinced of your, of your goodness, more encouraged to trust in your word, more... Um, encouraged to go after what you're saying. I'm asking that you open our eyes and that you give us wisdom, Lord, that you help us function as Bible-believing people, Lord. We give you all praise and glory, Lord, and I'm asking that you bless this morning. We say, this meeting is yours in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay. Wisdom self-portrait. Have you ever met a Christian who was annoyingly confident in God? Who was, no matter what the situation they found themselves in, their answer always seemed to be, let's see what God does. And not in a fake way, but a, yeah, they were really expecting God to move. And one that made you say, well, yeah, I was going to say that too, right? Christian who, they seemed to have this expectation that God wanted to move supernaturally in their lives and more annoyingly than their constant confidence in that was the fact that it seemed to happen. They seemed to have a different perspective on what it would mean for God to move in their life. And and you have this kind of question in your heart, what do they know that I don't? What do they see that I don't? What do they understand that I don't see? Because I know they're not more holy than me. Right? I read the Bible more than them. I work in children's ministry longer than them. Why is it that God seems to step in to their situations and they are so confident that God's about to move in whatever they're facing, but I have so many doubts that plague me and that I I pray but I don't really expect much. You know, I define, Webster's wouldn't say it this way, but I, when I think of the uh, concept of wisdom, I think of God's solution to earth's issues. God's solution to earth's issues. Today, I want to give you four Hebrew words. Four Hebrew words, and what I'm hoping is that it causes you to to challenge your own thinking about what it means to ask God for wisdom. You see, if you were to ask me, Scott, describe wisdom, personify wisdom, give wisdom a face, what does it look like? I kind of picture an older gentleman sitting in a rocking chair with a long beard, rocking slowly back and forth. When I ask him a question, he says, Scott, be very careful because the world's a dangerous place. When I think of wisdom, that can be what comes to mind. And for so many of us, when we go to God and when we're asking for wisdom, we're saying to him, show me what I've done wrong. I know. Help me to do it better. What if that wasn't how wisdom described wisdom? What if that's what, how Scott described wisdom? 
So today I'm, I want to go give you four Hebrew words. I want to look at how wisdom describes itself and, and ask us to challenge our own thinking on what that looks like. But before I do, I want to tell you about my first introduction to this kind of Christian who saw the world differently. It's a man by the name of Mike Adkins. He's a he's probably about 103 years old at this point. He's an old-time Christian that my parents knew. I did. When my parents um, really came to the Lord, they were really involved in a ministry called Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship International. Great name, I realize. It's a mouthful. And, and this Mike Adkins was a guy who would kind of do the circuit, if you will. He, he was a preacher and a singer. And both my mom and dad knew him, and they had their own stories about him that affected me early on. It affected me. And the, the first one is my mom w- was telling the story where she would have th- this annual retreat where she would go to, I think the place was Decatur, Illinois. And, 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 and she would go there with a bunch of her friends. It was just the females going to a regular conference, six, eight hundred people there. But they would do this once a year, and she, she loved it because she would hear great teaching great worship, and just get to, to mingle and mix with, with other women um, that she was close with. And this particular one, Mike Adkins, was, was speaking and singing, and he, he did a song called Thank You for the Dove, which you can find on YouTube, and it's, it's an older song. She loves it. And so she wanted, to, to ha- she wanted him to sing it, and she knew him. So she turned to the person next to her, her friend, and said, you know, I'm going to go ask him to make sure he sings this song. The person says, okay. And as she was doing it, she felt like God spoke to her heart and said, why don't you ask me to have him sing it? And she says, she says I'm thinking, Lord, he's right there, right? He's five feet away. I already know him, and I can just do this in ten seconds. But he says, why don't you ask me? So she says, okay, Lord, would you have him sing the song? And she tells the friend, listen, I felt like the Lord said to have him have him sing it. So the first night comes and Mike does his, sings some songs. He doesn't sing the song, Thank You for the Dove. And he does his preaching and I'm sure it was a good message and he finishes. But it's okay, he's got Saturday. So Saturday comes and he goes through his songs and he doesn't sing it. And she's kind of like, you know, remember, Lord, we talked about this. You, I could have just asked him. He was standing right there, and I know him. But you said, you said, have me ask him. And so, so I did. I asked him. I asked you. And nothing's happening. He finishes the song. Then he finishes the message, and he's walking off the stage. And the friend's like, well, you know, I guess God didn't hear you. Right? A little bit of disappointment. Wouldn't you be disappointed? Particularly if you could just solve that yourself. Mike walks off the stage, and Mom says he turns around, he walks back on the stage, he gets the microphone back, he says, I'm really, really sorry, but the Lord just spoke to me. And he said, I'm supposed to come back up here, and I need to sing the song, Thank You for the Dove, for one person in this room. That's the kind of thing where you felt seen, right? That's the kind of thing where you're like, oh, wow, let's see what God does. And and, and, And to even be Mike... Right to, to, to walk off the stage and to hear God say, go up and make a fool of yourself and sing one song for one person when there's 600 people in the room. Right? That's someone who's grounded. Let's see what God does. Dad, you want to come up? Dad knew him as well, and he has his own story of interacting with Mike that it isn't dramatic, but when he told me, it left an imprint even as a young guy on my heart. It's, as Scott described, full gospel businessmen. It was businessmen. It's not in a church. Uh, I actually met the Lord uh, in a full gospel businessmen convention at Lambert Airport Marriott Hotel in the big ballroom. There, a Catholic priest was speaking that night. Uh, about five or six—I don't know—five or six, seven years later, I'm the convention chairman, and this is a story Scott asked me to tell. Imagine that. Dad ended up in charge. It Sorry, was, it's Father's Day. I shouldn't say that. Uh, and I distracted you. <laughs> Jogger's males like to be the center of attention. So <laughs> kind of like Olivia. Right. <laughs> anyway, 
one of the tasks at the convention chairman is we have the big banquet and the banquets a set down dinner and I'm supposed to guarantee to the hotel the amount of people because we're going to have to pay, I don't know, $20 a head for all the people. So I'm trying very conservative to do this judiciously because it's a faith ministry. Long story short, I think I'm get guaranteed, I don't know, 250, 280 people for the banquet. And that night, Mike Adkins is the main speaker and we're on the head table. Well, I messed up the number somehow because there's many more people coming. Maybe they didn't call in a reserve. I'm not sure. But I messed up the number and there's people coming up to the head table and they're very upset. Uh, there's not enough tables set. There's not enough food prepared. So I eventually, because I'm young and I want to please the people, I'm kind of upset. So I go to the mic and I take responsibility. I said, hey, I guaranteed the number that was too low and the hotel is going to set up additional tables, are going to provide additional food, and I want to apologize to everyone here. That's what the ruckus is. So I sat back down. Well, people continue to come late. Apparently, and, people had opinions. That wouldn't happen here, but at the time, people would tend to give their opinion. So I'm getting more upset as more people are coming late, and, and I'm finding out there's still people that are upset. So I'm starting to get up again, and all of a sudden, Mike puts his hand on me and says, Terry, you have already apologized. You have already told him you made the mistake. Let's just see what God will do. Well, Mike was such an icon and speaking at these conventions all the time. I just sat back down and I kind of had no idea what he's saying, but just trust God. And this was kind of my first introduction to uh, that type of thing. Thanks, Dad. Perfect. Let's see what God will do. Oh, it worked out. That's the end of that story. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it worked out somehow. They got more tables, they got more chairs, and everybody was happy, and everyone left happily ever after. But what I was trying to draw out is, let's see what God will do. Let's see what God will do. Who thinks like that? Who talks like that? People with a different perspective on what it means to ask God for things and ask God for wisdom. For Hebrew words. So before we do that, I want to read Proverbs 8, 22 through 35. This is interesting because it's wisdom talking about wisdom. What I mean is, this is the Lord speaking through King Solomon, and it's talk, it's it's saying I wisdom, and it gives it a self-portrait, an autobiography, a one, a 12 verse or whatever this is, autobiography of what wisdom thinks wisdom looks like. Remember, Scott thinks wisdom looks like an old gentleman with a long beard and a rocking chair, rocking slowly back and forth, saying, be careful, the world's a dangerous place. Here's what wisdom thinks wisdom looks like. Verse 22, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, from everlasting, I was established from the beginning from the earliest times of the earth. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle in the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became fixed, when he set for the sea its boundaries so that its water shall not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundation of the earth, there I was beside him as a master workman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. Now therefore, O sons, listen to me. For blessed are they who keep my ways. Heed instruction and be wise. Do not neglect it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorposts. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Four words. What are they? The first one is amon. Amon. I'm sure I'm going to butcher the pronunciations. And I want to say before I go any, fur go any further on this, 
I hesitate to go Hebrew words, and I will tell you why. For those of you who are very accustomed to your Bible, you like, and, and some of you really like going in and digging into the Hebrew and the Greek words. The uh, New Testament was written in Greek and the Old Testament Hebrew. Let, let's just leave it there. And you like digging in and, and really figuring out the words, and, and I love that too. But if you're new to your Bibles, you're, you might be thinking, I don't, I don't know Hebrew or Greek. I guess I can't study the Bible. And I want to say, do not think that. Okay, I went through a phase where I was looking up every other word. And you know what I discovered? The Bible was translated very well. It really was. So, encouragement there. But, the first word, I'm going to do it anyways because I hold the microphone. And the first word is Amon. Amon. And you find it in verse 30. It says, there I was beside him as a master workman. That word is, that is master workman. It also uh, defines like a master architect. Master architect. Remember, this is wisdom describing itself. So imagine you're sitting in Genesis chapter 1, and you're about to see God create the world. Well, something occurs before he says, let there be light, which is Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. And that is God establishes and brings forth something he calls wisdom. Now, I don't 100% know what that means or how that looked. I know 1 Corinthians 1 says that Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. But when he, when he started, he was there with wisdom, forming the world, creating the world, structuring the world. And he uses wisdom to describe itself, uses that phrase, master architect. Now, it makes me think of my favorite American architect, a man by the name of Frank Lloyd Wright. He is an interesting human. I know absolutely nothing about architecture. But I, I, I've, I've really, I enjoy seeing Genius at work, even if the genius doesn't serve God. Right? And so Frank Lloyd writes, his architecture is interesting even for someone who knows as little about building and fixing things as me. And, and, and it, like, that's low. I know next to nothing. When I'm looking at Frank Lloyd Wright's work, like, it's impressive to me. He is known for or organic architecture he combined he kind of weaved seamlessly nature and homes so they're super expensive but they're beautiful to look at it doesn't look like a home dropped in the middle of nature it looks like the home is part of nature his most famous one i think it might be his most famous one is called falling water you can look it up falling water house and it feels like it's got a waterfall or a stream flowing through the middle of the house and it just weaves together seamlessly this element of, of structure and, and human comfort with the beauty of nature, and they work seamlessly together. Now, I'm 100% sure wisdom functions in a greater way than Frank Lloyd Wright. But you have to understand that when God is forming the world, when he's structuring, when he's putting it together, wisdom uses this phrase, almon of itself, meaning I'm a master architect. Seamlessly weaving beauty and construction and structure so that it's both useful and aesthetically pleasing. That's the first word. The second one is cool. Cool. You find this in verse 24 and verse 25. It says this. When there was no depth, I was brought forth. How it's translated is the word brought forth. Cool. When there was no depth, I was brought forth. When there was no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. In lots of places, it's translated brought forth. In lots of others, in other places, it's translated, now watch this, to dance to whirl, to writhe. So another painter I'm interested in is a guy by the name of Jackson Pollock. He's the splatter paint guy. The guy who paints like you kind of think, yeah, my four-year-old could do better than that. Right? Like it's, it's, it's a mess. But I started reading about him because he's kind of an interesting guy. Right? He, he died very young because he was into a lot of stuff he shouldn't be. Instead of sitting down at the canvas with an easel and a paintbrush, painting beautiful scenery like Monet might have, he took 
massive canvases, either tack them to the wall or put them on the floor, and he would get sticks and dry brushes, and he would dip them in, and he would begin to, someone was describing watching him work. And, and what it was like was he would begin to whirl and to dance and to fling paint. Makes me think, I could do that. Right? But interestingly enough, some research into it found that, and I don't even understand what I'm talking about here, but there was something about the repeating randomness about his paint that was repeated in nature. That there was a creative element to it that actually you see in nature, and cognitive neuroscientists said that part of his work would actually have stress-reducing elements. Now, that's kind of weird, because I can look at his painting and say, well, I like my bowls of fruit with apples and clear bananas, not this mess. So it feels like it causes me stress. But for people who are stressed out, just seeing his work actually has stress-reducing elements. I don't know if any of that's true. I don't care. My point is, when wisdom is describing itself, one of the words it's using is a word that it means like to dance and to whirl. Now remember, I see wisdom as an old man with a long beard in a rocking chair, rocking, rocking slowly, saying, be careful, the world's a dangerous place. And so far, wisdom writing his own autobiography is describing himself as a master architect who's dancing. What's the third word? Shashua. It means delight. This is verse 30 and verse 31. It's in two different places. There I was beside him as a master workman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. When wisdom's describing itself, it's using the word delight. Now, listen to this. It says that I, wisdom, was daily the delight of the Father. And I, in turn, delighted in the sons of men. So I'm thinking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, talking about me. Okay, we're building Scott. And there's a delightedness when they're putting me together, when they're weaving me together, when he's thinking about what I'm going to give Scott. And, and maybe, maybe Jesus is saying, how much technical ability should we give him? And God the Father says, zero. <laughs> really? Okay, how much should we give him really good with directions? Oh, God, let's give him another zero. But I, I can see, but I can see there's a delight in them. That's how God created you. When wisdom is describing the process he is using to create, he calls it delight. Dancing delight. Dancing delight. Brings us to the fourth. Sawkak. I'm sure I butchered that pronunciation. Rejoicing is how it's translated. Verse 30 and 31. There I was beside him as a master workman. Daily his delight. Rejoicing always before him. Rejoicing in the world his earth and having my delight in the sons of men. The most common way that word, shawkak, is translated in the Bible is to laugh. It makes me think of my favorite comedian, Tim Conway. I love Steve Carell. He's second. But my favorite is Tim Conway. You know, if you're younger, you may have no idea who Tim Conway is. He was in a show called The Carol Burnett Show, which I was actually, I think, too young to watch. Either I was too young to watch or I just never did. But I ended up on YouTube seeing clips of Tim Conway. What made Tim Conway special is he's part of this Carol Burnett Show, which was like a live comedic entertainment and, and I read about what he did because I thought he was just fantastic. And what they would do is they would practice beforehand what, what their, their skits or whatever they're called. They're like Saturday Night Live kind of skits, but it was Carol Burnett Show. And so they would practice them beforehand and everyone would do everything right. Except Tim Conway, when it went live, would change everything. He would change the script. He would change his voice. He would change what he was going to do. And nobody had any idea what he was doing except Tim Conway because Tim Conway wasn't actually trying to entertain anybody. Tim Conway had one goal, and it was to make the another guy, a guy by the name of Harvey Corman, lose it on stage. 
That was his goal. And so some of my favorite clips are, and they describe it as, they practiced it, and then all of a sudden Tim Conway walks up, he starts talking in a different voice, and he goes in a direction that Harvey Corman has no idea what's supposed to happen next, and he would just start to lose it. For me, it created some of the greatest comedic moments that I've ever seen. I laughed hard watching him try to make one guy laugh. I remember when Harvey, seeing this on YouTube as well, Harvey Corman received an Emmy, called up for winning an award for TV. And they call him up and says, the winner is Harvey Corman. And he walks up and, but Tim Conway from over there walks up too. So Harvey Corman is just standing right here like this, about to give his speech. And Tim Conway, who is about five foot five, he was a little guy, and, and Harvey's big, I think. At least that's how they look. Comes up, stands like literally with his face in his armpit, just standing there just like this. The entire speech. And so you don't even remember the speech. I couldn't remember a word Harvey said because you spend the entire time watching Tim very deadpanned looking there. And it's hilarious to laugh. So when wisdom puts pen to paper and says, I'm going to describe myself, the words he uses our dancing, laughing, master architect who's delighting in what he does. I want you to think about that. The laughing, dancing, master architect delighting in creation. And Scott thinks it's an old man in a rocking chair saying, be careful. Can you see the different perspective? When I think it's going to be, okay, I'm asking for wisdom, tell me what I did wrong, it removes, let's see what God's going to do from the equation entirely. But if I perceive wisdom as a laughing, dancing master architect delighting in creation, then all of a sudden, let's see what God does makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? No wonder why the scripture says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and doesn't withhold, but let him ask of faith. So it says, yeah, Ask, and wis ask for wisdom, and, and I want to do that. And I'm thinking, yep, Lord, show me what I did wrong. And hear me, I've always done stuff wrong. But the perspective of wisdom, wisdom thinks wisdom looks very different than Scott thinks wisdom looks like. That was a weird sentence. But I want to say it again. Wisdom looks very different than what Scott thinks wisdom looks like. The laughing, dancing master architect who takes delight in creation. So when I've got my issues, when it's, Lord, I need wisdom, what do I do? God's saying, you know what I want to do to decorate your world? I want to bring Frank Lloyd Wright, Jackson Pollock, and Tim Conway in and decorate this mess. That's his perspective on what I'm going through. I'm looking for my answer in death, and the only thing he's speaking is life. I don't mean it's always going to work out the way I want it to. I mean it speaks life. No wonder why the end of Proverbs 8 says, For he who finds me finds life. Why? Because wisdom's the dancing, laughing, master architect who delights in creation. That's the guy, or that's who what I'm asking for when I'm saying, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me an insane amount of creativity in dealing supernaturally with this situation that I find myself in. What if we served a God with storehouses of creativity available for us in the very situations we find ourselves in rather than just wanting to say to me, Here's what you've done wrong. Don't get me wrong. When I'm asking for wisdom, frequently I've done something wrong. And you know what the frequently I've done something wrong is normally? You don't see things the way I see things. I want to wrap up with this verse. It gives me a different perspective on this verse. Ephesians 3.20. Many of you will have heard this verse. It says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, According to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask or think. When what I ask and think is related to give me wisdom so I can see what I do, did wrong, old gentleman. 
What I can ask and think is super low. But when I'm perceiving wisdom, when I'm asking for wisdom and I'm seeing it as this laughing, dancing master architect who's delighting in creation, that's why I mess it up so much. That's why my thinking is never in line with his thinking because I don't even understand the concept and the delight that he is taking in structuring and defining me and my life and the situations that I find myself in. He delights in you. Your weirdness, he loves it. Your uniqueness, your craziness. Your combing your hair with your fingers and being braided by someone who has no idea how to braid, he loves it. He loves those unique pieces of you because he put them together. And then he says, hey, listen, come talk to me. I'm going to give you wisdom. And what he thinks he's saying when he says, I'm going to give you wisdom, is I'm going to give you access to laughing, dancing, master architect who delights in you. And what I think he's saying is, let me show you what what you're doing wrong. Let's stand. Galen, you still here? Good job. Thanks. Galen's been strumming for a long time today. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. According to that power. Can you see how maybe God's perspective of wisdom is dramatically different than our own? And our own limited experience perspective causes us to expect so little of him that that question of let's see what God's going to do never really enters our brain because what we're used to is what God wants to do is just keep the status quo, show you what you did wrong, help develop your character. I believe all those things are true. But he also likes to, hey, don't ask him, ask me to have him sing the song. I want to do it super dramatically again. Right? I want to challenge you to think differently. I want to challenge you to ask for wisdom, but ask for wisdom with the wisdom that wisdom looks differently than you've thought ever thought before. That there's a delightful creativity to how God approaches situations you're in. I want to challenge you to to spend time in the Word. And when you ask in faith, go to the God who's giving wisdom, when you're asking for wisdom, and it says that He gives to all generously. So what that means is when I ask for wisdom, He is saying, I'm going to generously give you access to insane amounts of creativity and design Because I want to structure your world, and bigger than that, I want you to have an impact on the world around you. And I'm going to give you wisdom to do that. If you want prayer for sickness or for anything, we want to pray for you. If you have never, if you're not sure where you stand with Jesus this morning, and you're not, you're like, man, I have just been muddling through, and I don't, I don't know that I believe, but I want to. We want to pray for you this morning. And I'm going to say, as soon as I, I'm going to close in prayer right now, but Galen and, and Nathaniel are going to play a little bit here in the background. Same thing I say every Sunday, every time. Do business with God. Do business with God until you're done doing business with God today. Don't let the moment pass, because if you're anything like me, what happens is you walk out that door, you say, I'm going to, do, I'm going to deal with that in a little bit, and I forget what I promised them I was going to deal with, I forget to deal with. So do business with God. But let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, Lord, I'm asking for wisdom for every member of this congregation, Lord. I'm asking for you to to show us your delightful creativity, your dancing, laughing creativity. Father, I want to thank you for the delight you have had in us as a people. I want to thank you for the delight you had in, in, in structuring and building me. And I'm sorry for the numerous ways I've abused that. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom, Father. 
Lord, I ask that you guide and protect each person in this room and those of us who are, are watching on YouTube. Lord, I ask that you protect, that you guide, that you lead, that you show us your, your love, your favor, your joy, your peace. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. Have a wonderful Father's Day. We'll see you guys soon. And don't forget, stay in worship. Stay in, stay in the presence of God. If that's where you're at right now, stay in the presence of God. But if not, have a great Father's Day. We'll see you soon.